Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to your antenatal education series. Um, thank you so much, everybody who has watched the series so far. Um, we've had some fantastic feedback, and as a result of your feedback, we are now in a position to give you some um, pregnancy information that we haven't yet covered. Um, I'd like to introduce Lorna Bird and Louise Barton. Um, they are responsible for all the maternity information at Southampton and have very kindly joined us today to, to give you this um, information. So I'm just going to hand over to Lorna now to start. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, sorry everybody, we would normally deliver this to you um, face to face in our pa early parent information evening that you come to as soon as you find out you're pregnant. Um, with lots of outside exhibitors, but clearly we can't do that in the moment with the current situation, but we hope to return sometime soon when it's safe for you and us. So the information we're going to cover, um, a bit about early pregnancy, a bit about your antenatal care schedule and when you're going to see the midwife, some information on diet and exercise, if you're a smoker, some smoking cessation information, travel and car seat safety, medications in pregnancy, who's here to support you because we know this is a very difficult time for your mental well-being, your emotional well-being. A bit about sex in pregnancy, that question you always want to ask but a bit embarrassed to ask maybe. What we're doing about research and our feedback from the Department of Health, Friends and Family. So what we have is um, all the information here. We don't expect you to remember everything, um, but our UHS maternity pages, and we've done some special pages, um, which has a COVID-19 link, which has all the antenatal education as well, as well as lots of other helpful information from you. So you can source it from there. The other place to go is, which are very useful apps and web pages for you. Um, most important one that you will um, get to learn to use throughout your pregnancy and when your baby's born, because uh, we the GPs use this as well, is the Wessex Healthier Together app. That links to lots of other apps and information as well, and is available over in over a hundred different languages. So if English isn't your first language, um, it has links on there to, to go to your first language. Um, when you're choosing where to have your baby, my birthplace app on there is very useful information and I'm sure Amy and the girls have covered that in previous um, classes. Baby Buddy app, you download an avatar that looks like you so you can be as creative as you like and it links to over about 200 videos as well. Lots on mental wellbeing um, as well on that one. Tommy's website, excellent information about your baby's movements, little videos and information sheets. National Childbirth Trust, uh, Bounty, iTalk, uh, NHS pages, Steps to Wellbeing. Lullaby Trust is more for afterwards, for safer sleep for your babies. And for those birth partners, although it's called Dad Pad, it's for birth partners as well, whoever that may be, whoever your partner is. Um, excellent information on there as well. And I know Amy and the girls have told you a bit about that as well. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Lorna. Um, so I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about early pregnancy. Um, many of you have probably um, experienced some, some of these signs and symptoms of pregnancy. Um, if you're watching this video, but it might be that you're watching because you are at the moment trying to get pregnant and um, are looking for information. So it is a little bit about early pregnancy. So the signs and symptoms um, can include, but aren't exhausted, um, tender swollen breasts, and that's usually a, a very early sign, nausea, um, the need to go and, and urinate frequently at the beginning of pregnancy is very normal. Um, feeling tired and fatigued, it's um, one of those times, it's a bit unfair really, because when you're, when you're early pregnant, you haven't got a bump and nobody really knows that you're pregnant yet, yet you're feeling so tired. Your body is growing a human and that first 12 weeks can be really exhausting. 
So fatigue is a, a very common um, symptom. Food aversion or food cravings. Um, I'm sure some of you could tell us some of your weird and wonderful food cravings, but sometimes you go off of food as well, or, or the smell of food, the smell of coffee or, or curry, or you might want to eat things like soap. That's quite normal too. Don't eat soap though. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sometimes there can be um, a very slight bleeding in the, in the early stages of pregnancy as your, as, as your placenta is implanting and, and there can be slight bleeding. That's nothing to worry about and that is quite normal. But if it is um, fresh red bleeding like period loss, then, then you would need to speak to um, a midwife or a GP. Um, slight crampings, that's not unusual at the beginning. Mood swings. Um, mood swings are very normal in early pregnancy as your hormones are changing. Um, your partner is probably the best person to alert you to this if you, if you aren't aware that you're, you're having mood swings. Um, and sometimes constipation or diarrhea, that can be um, a sign too. So it, it's glamorous stuff this early pregnancy. Um, some people will have all of those symptoms and some people will have none at all. Um, everybody is very individual and you may just have a couple of those symptoms. Um, we, we can't tell who, who, will, who will get them and who won't. So feelings in early pregnancy. Um, obviously early pregnancy is a, a really exciting time <clears throat> and you'll be really excited and, and wanting to tell everybody. But it's also really important to understand that lots of people feel really overwhelmed when they find out they're pregnant. Even if they've been trying for a long time to get pregnant, it can be a really overwhelming feeling um, of responsibility and of how life is going to change. You can be quite fearful about how your life is going to change throughout your pregnancy and when you become parents. And it can be quite confusing because there is a wealth of information out there on the net now. You can, you can Google anything. Um, be very careful when you go, go onto the internet and, and only um, access reputable NHS websites or charities um, who have reputable information because there is a lot of information out there that is not kosher. And if you have any concerns about that, then you must just speak to your midwife or your consultant. Um, nausea and vomiting, we've talked about nausea as one of the early symptoms of pregnancy. It is very normal to feel um, nauseous and have early, early morning sickness or, or sickness in early pregnancy. Um, this usually lasts up to about 16 to 20 weeks and after 16 to 20 weeks it wears off and, and it's not so bad throughout the rest of the pregnancy. Um, if it is quite bad, your morning sickness during your early stage of labour, then you, there are ways that you will find to cope with it. Some people say ginger nut biscuits in the morning are good, or you know, keep, keeping hydrated is, is the most important thing, and eating little and often so that you don't get dehydrated and, and don't have any energy. Um, hyperemesis is when pregnancy nausea and vomiting doesn't cease. Um, it is significant nausea and vomiting that continues after 20 weeks of pregnancy. And it generally affects about 1% to 3% of pregnancies. Um, and it can, be, it can be really quite, um, quite debilitating. Um, lots of women are able to cope with this at home. Again, keeping hydrated and eating little and often. But sometimes if you just can't keep anything down, you can't even keep a glass of water down, it might be that you'll need to ask the GP for, for some help. And that might be medication such as um, an antiemetic, such as cyclozine. Um, that might help your nausea and, and um, stop your sickness. But in the most extreme of cases, if you can't keep anything down at all, it might mean um, a short hospital admission to control your, your, your vomiting and to rehydrate you with um, fluids, um, intravenous fluids that go into a drip. Um, like I said, it's only one to 3% of pregnancies, but we do understand that the women who are affected by hyperemesis um, need support and, and, and need help. So <clears throat> I've got a link just at the bottom here to um, a reputable charity called Pregnancy Sickness Support. And you can, um, you can go on this link and there is all sorts of support on there from morning sickness to hyperemesis. 
um, and the treatment and support available if you if you are are suffering with that. Um, okay, so you, as always at the beginning at the beginning of these presentations, we always say if you have any questions at all, please just write in the link below, and we'll answer your questions as soon as we possibly can. I'm just going to hand over to Heather to talk to you about antenatal care schedule. Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, so things have changed ever so slightly in terms of when you are contacting us, when you're seeing us face to face or over the phone. So we're just going to run through that so that you can see what those changes are. But don't forget that just because you're not having a regular appointment that you may have been used to in a previous pregnancy, it doesn't mean that there aren't numbers and you can't contact your midwife or your GP as well. OK, so once you let us know that you are pregnant, whether you've done that via the GP or our self referral a self-referral service um, the triage midwives will give you a call to arrange a booking telephone with you um, telephone booking even um, it is midwives and our MSWs who are getting that information from you and what we want to find out is things about your medical history your social history um, your general mental health and well-being and also we need to find out some information about your partner as well because we need to know about genetics and how your DNA is mixing together to make this baby that you are now growing Okay, so you have that around about 10 to 12 weeks. And once you've had that, we will request an ultrasound scan for you. So that's when you come to the Princess Anne and you go into ultrasound, they take measurements from babies and we can work out what the date, the due date of this baby is approximately. Don't forget this baby doesn't know what that due date is going to be. So it is an approximation. So you've got the dating scan, but what we've also now got to reduce the number of times you're having to see people face to face is a one-stop antenatal check so this is a team who are at the princess anne they will be taking your booking bloods um, so taking your iron levels your blood group type um, they'll be looking at all of the things that we need to know about your genetics and antibodies um, and they will do that there for you as well okay um, your next appointment will be at 16 weeks and for everybody this will be over the telephone this will either be with the midwife who originally did your booking for you or it will be with a midwife who will continue your care for the rest of the pregnancy but you'll have the appointment and we'll phone you at that time do a bit of a checkup for you and see how things are going okay um, at 25 weeks the only people we would ever see would be women who haven't had a baby before or women who have had a baby before but by a c-section so be back okay so 25 weeks that contact was is done face to face um, we've mentioned before the hubs around the city so you've got places like rsh you've got um western center you've also got the adelaide uh, a few more that are in there and that's where that will be done okay so that is a face-to-face check up for you, we start measuring your bump, we're listening to baby, doing your blood pressure, checking your urine, all of the routine things we do in an antenatal appointment. Um, at 28 weeks, we see everybody. So it doesn't matter if you've had a baby before, if you haven't had a baby before, you've had one by cesarean birth, um, we would see you face to face. Now for everybody, we check uh, the iron levels. Um, so to your, what we call our 28 week blood checks. So we're checking your iron levels and we're also taking a second sample of your blood group and your antibodies. Um, and also at the moment, those of you who would be, um, uh, what am I thinking about? A glucose tolerance test. So those of you who might be susceptible to developing gestational diabetes, so diabetes in pregnancy, um, usually you'd have a glucose tolerance test, which is take your bloods, have a sugary drink, two hours later, we take your bloods again. But we are doing a slightly different test now, and that will be done at your 28 week appointment. So no need to fast at the moment. Um, 32 weeks, so previously we've had 31 and 34, but 32 weeks we see everybody face to face. And at 36 weeks, we have a slightly longer appointment with you because we want to talk through your birth preferences with you. So watching these videos, all the prior conversations you've had with the midwife, um, as well as all your own research that you've done, bring it to that 36 week appointment. I love it when a woman turns up and she's got a list of questions or right, this is what I'd really like. Tell me what I can do. Tell me what I can't do. I was like, well, as long as it's safe, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but we allow an hour for that appointment so that we can do your routine antenatal care. And then we can look through what your options are and fill in the gaps. So basically where the service can meet your needs. 
38 weeks, again, we're seeing everybody face to face. Uh, we talk a little bit about postnatal care at 38 weeks, about vaccinations for baby, uh, screening tests for baby. We talk about contraception at 38 weeks as well, just to get that little thought in your head, because you are ridiculously fertile when you're pregnant. We want to make sure that you don't go to your six weeks checkup to get a congratulations from the doctor because you're pregnant again, unless that's what you want. Um, and then at 40 weeks again, we are seeing women who haven't had a baby before. We're not seeing everybody at 40 weeks. So our current guidance at Southampton at the moment is that if you would like a stretch and sweep, which is where we talked about it before, the internal examination to check the dilation of your cervix to see if we can uh, catalyst it into action, that's being offered um, with due diligence and making sure you understand the, the risks and everything at 39 weeks. So primates we're seeing it at 40 weeks and everybody else we are seeing at 41 and discussing about induction of labor as well. So really for everybody at 40 weeks, if you would like to have a stretch as week, you can, you can consider it, we offer it. It's not, this is what will happen. Um, and we would repeat it at 41 weeks if this baby is still not born. Um, so there is a little bit of flexibility in there. If you feel you need that extra support, if you've had a baby before, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just let your midwife know and we'll make those adjustments for you. All we're trying to do with this adjusted antenatal care schedule is reduce the number of times you have to come in, um, but just to make sure that you feel safe with everything that's going on at the moment. So keep an eye on the um, Southampton Maternity Service page because it, when we have updates about the changing schedule, then we will let you know. Um, okay, who's next? Right, Louise is going to talk about diet in pregnancy. Thank you, Heather. Yes, no just to um, give you a little bit more information about diet, I understand that um, it can be a little bit overwhelming to work out what you can and can't eat during pregnancy. And really just to um, recap what Amy was saying about making sure you're eating little and often to con um, quell those feelings of, of nausea. So really want to say, ladies, I'm sorry we're not eating for two. And Lorna will come back to that when she talks a little bit more about weight gain and exercise. So um, until that third trimester of pregnancy, it's really not more than a couple of hundred calories extra in your diet. So really, it's the same sort of dietary advice we'd give most people anyway. So to enjoy things like fruit and vegetables, but really, ladies, to make sure that you're paying attention to, to hygiene, so washing your fruit and vegetables thoroughly if you're eating them raw, um, to make sure that if you're eating meat that it's cooked through thoroughly. We know that um, rare meats can unfortunately carry a risk of, of food poisoning and we don't want that to carry across to your, your, your baby. So it's really making sure as well that you're getting all the, uh, the vitamins and minerals you, you need by having what we call those that rainbow of um, fruit and vegetables. So um, there's another little picture at the top of this slide that gives you a kind of a rainbow of fruit and vegetables, picking different fruit and vegetables um, from different colours of the rainbow so that you've got that balance of, of vitamins and, and minerals. But also we know that fruit alongside vegetables and cereals gives you the fibre that you need. Unfortunately, ladies, pregnancy makes you a little bit more prone to constipation. So if we can ease that naturally for you through your diet, then cereals, brown rice, wholemeal pasta, those sorts of things are, are really important. Um, in terms of uh, dairy products, uh, we recommend that you have two to three portions of uh, dairy products a day. And if you're not somebody that eats dairy products and you're looking at dairy alternatives, please make sure they're fortified with um, calcium and vitamin D so that you're getting that calcium and, and vitamin D to um, encourage your baby's bone development and we'll come back a little bit to the vitamins in a moment but in terms of those those dairy products they need to be pasteurized dairy products so hard cheeses like your cheddar your edam they're absolutely fine with your soft cheeses please check that they're pasteurized so the cooked soft cheeses mozzarella halloumi again they're fine the ones to avoid are your breeze and your camembert your blue vein cheeses those i'm afraid just because of the um risk of um food poisoning we ask you to avoid those so sorry if we're ruining your your diet plan um <laughs> so in terms of fish uh, th this advice can all feel a little bit specific but it is all on the um 
Department of Health NHS website. So if you feel like, oh, I can't remember what Louise said, please do have a look at that as well. Recommended for your, your baby's um, brain development, two portions of fish a week and preferably one of those being oily fish, things like salmon, mackerel, trout, but not both, not more than two portions of oily fish because unfortunately those fish can pick up pollutants in the water and then you, you ingest those. Um, so yeah, so it does feel very specific, but again, with things like tuna, not, I'm not sure that anyone would, but not more than four cans a week um, or two tuna steaks. So I'm making Heather laugh, look here, it does feel very specific. I, I say this to women, I'm, I, I say, <laughs> you know you can't have more than three i don't like tuna so that seems a ridiculously excessive amount of tuna <laughs> I, don't, I don't think i've ever eaten more than four cans of tuna in a week <laughs> no, but it, it can feel fussy but it's just making sure that you know we've got a lovely list on here of all the things to avoid as well so avoiding like i said those unpasteurized dairy products those uncooked meats like salami um that sort of thing to avoiding your prawns I'm afraid and your um I don't know I don't even know anyone that ever would eat shark and swordfish maybe you do but unfortunately not during during pregnancy and again being careful with eggs 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 that have the lion stamp mark on them are vaccinated against salmonella and it's salmonella that we worry about because unfortunately it can carry a risk of, of miscarriage for, for babies um so it's making sure that you're cooking eggs thoroughly and that you're not having sort of raw meringue or anything like that. So, so do have a look, like I say, at the um, NHS website just to sort of reiterate these things for you. But I'm afraid, ladies, as well, we're a little bit mean, I suppose, when it comes to the caffeine as well. So we're asking you really to limit your, your caffeine intake during pregnancy to 200 milligrams a day. So that's like two mugs of coffee or a mug of coffee and a cup of tea. Um, I think you can get some chocolate in there somewhere if you, if you work out the, the maths with it too. Um, but it's just really important that you keep your caffeine levels to a minimum. And sadly, we say no alcohol during pregnancy. We don't know as, as midwives what the safest level of alcohol is during pregnancy. We only know that too, too much alcohol um, can affect your baby's development and well-being. So it's safer to say have none at all that doesn't mean to say that if you had the odd drink and that's how you became pregnant and using our services in the first place that that should cause you any problems um, but do keep your alcohol levels to zero through your your pregnancy and and like I said um, sadly we're not eating for two so those sweets crisps chocolates cakes keep them as treats rather than being an all day, every day occurrence. So uh, hopefully that helps and I'll pass on to Lorna to give you a little bit more information about exercise and weight gain. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Louise. Um, along with diet clearly comes exercise. If you're somebody that's never exercised before, we don't say suddenly go out and start doing lots of strenuous exercise, but why are we saying this? We're really saying this to keep you healthy. Um, we want you to prevent gaining lots of weight during your pregnancy. And, and by doing that, you'll be reducing the risks of um, gestational diabetes that Heather's already talked about and things like preeclampsia as well, when you have raised blood pressure um, and swelling and protein in your um, passing in your urine. Um, and it's really important for your mood. Most, it makes you feel good when you exercise. The thought of it might not, um, but even going for a walk, and we're not saying if you're somebody that doesn't walk, then um, we say try to keep active on a daily basis, and that's 30 minutes a day. Now you probably do that in a normal day without thinking about it, um, but if you're not someone that walks, try starting with 10 minutes a day. Do little and often. Um, if you're someone who catches the bus, maybe get off the stop one stop earlier and walk that extra bit. This is in early pregnancy. Those last few weeks in pregnancy, hopefully you'll be on maternity leave and might not be catching buses so much, but um, do, do what's right for you. Um, we always say always warm up and cool down before you exercise and avoiding strenuous exercises. I know in the last couple of weeks, it's been really warm. 
Um, so you do have to be careful. You do need to drink plenty of water. At the moment, classes aren't going on for anybody, but there's lots of alternatives on Zoom. Um, but when, if in this time, if you do um, have an instructor in a class and it's an interactive one, do say that you are pregnant and they're very good at adapting classes for you as well. Um, when the swimming pools reopen, not at the moment, you are entitled to free swimming at the Key to Health um, at Bitten uh, Leisure Centre. All you need to do is take along your pregnancy notes or, or your bump, which of course you have with you, not in early pregnancy, they can't see that. Um, and they will give you a card for free swimming. Our midwives do um, Zoom yoga classes at the moment. And again, they are a live thing that we do when we can. And our, we, there is also um, aquanatal classes and they're at Bitten Health Centre. And that's by two of our midwives as well. So not only do you get good exercise, you get to meet other pregnant mums as well. So it's a bit of a social um, for you as well and you can make friends whilst you're pregnant. Um, you should avoid activity where there's a risk of falling. So if you're a, a keen horse rider, you do need to be careful. Um, there won't be any skiing in the summer or you won't be going anywhere. And ice hockey is things like that. Team sports aren't. I know they're coming back, but do be careful. Um, after 16 weeks of pregnancy, we say you don't, don't, we advise you to not lie on your back for long periods of time. And this is because, the, because of the blood um, return to the heart and you can feel a bit dizzy and faint. So lying on your side is much better than lying flat or lying with a few pillows. Uh, contact sports we know aren't happening at the moment, but when they do return, be careful of those. We don't recommend diving. So if you are a diver, I'm sorry about that. And that's um, because of the, the levels that you go to and the pressures. Uh, no new strenuous exercise. Um, but most importantly, if you don't do any of that, apart from go for a walk, pelvic floor exercises. That's what we really, really do want you to do because we know and research has told us that one in three women after they've had a baby, if they laugh, cough or sneeze, actually wet themselves. Now, you can start those now from today doing your pelvic floor exercises. There's, there's plenty of videos out there on YouTube and Amy's put a link down below. But if you are an app person, there's an excellent app that our physiotherapists um, recommend and that's called Squeezy so a nice easy um, <laughs> name no, a nice easy app to remember I think I've got that Lord, about I use that <laughs> okay brilliant and and uh, ladies this is something that you have to do for your lifetime now once you've had a baby um, to help you with your pelvic floor what we want you to do is return your pelvic floor to as much as possible like it was before it's never a hundred percent the same once you've had a baby but you can you can work on your pelvic floor and if you start now you'll be doing yourself a massive favor so again any questions about any exercise then do ask your midwife but also we have an obstetric physiotherapist here at the Princess Town. we're very lucky that you can refer yourself all the way through your pregnancy and two weeks after you've had your baby. So if you have any problems with your joints, which we know is quite common, um, or you want some advice, then please get ask your midwife for the phone number and talk to the talk to our physiotherapists. So along with those two things goes weight gain in pregnancy. Onto our onto our next slide. So this is just showing you roughly where the weight gain goes in your pregnancy, which you can see it's distributed in different areas. Now it's really important that you know your body mass index and that will be printed on the, fir on the first sheet of your, um, uh, of your notes. When you did your booking, the midwife would have calculated your height and your weight and put that in. 
Um, and the bigger your body mass index, the less weight we really want you to put on. So if you have a normal body mass index between 18.5 kilos and 24.9, then the recommended weight gain is 11.5 to 15 kilos. If you go up the next bracket between 25 and 29.9, we recommend seven to 11.5 kilos. And above 30 kilos, um, we recommend five to nine. If your BMI is above, sorry, 30, we recommend the weight gain of five to nine kilos. So, and this is all about preventing problems for you and your baby in your pregnancy and also for your labor and birth. And it may change your birthplace the bigger your BMI is and obviously the more weight you put on. We're, we're very lucky here as well because we have a specialist health in pregnancy midwife. That midwife is Carol Kenyon and she, off, she runs uh, health in pregnancy workshops which currently aren't running at the moment but she is going to put together some information for you which will be accessible on, on with all the other antenatal information. So if you're a Southampton lady uh, with a Southampton City midwife, you, we have specialist midwives within each team that can give you advice about diet and weight gain and exercise and, um, and how to keep healthy in pregnancy. If you're a Hampshire lady, so that's the ladies in the forest and the hedge end area, um, you can access a weight and wellness program um, and that is delivered by Weight Watchers um, and have specialists, they're doing things by Zoom and have um, specialist help and support with that. Um, we've also got a page on our maternity pages and that has a diet and physical activity diary that you can fill in and it also has a self-evaluation tool if you look through your antenatal notes there is information in your notes without going anywhere there's also information about weight gain and we will be weighing you at a couple of intervals throughout your pregnancy and talking to you and advising advising you with that so again, any questions with any of these things, then please check with your own midwife what's available for you. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Heather, who's going to talk a little bit about smoking. Thanks, Lorna. Um, yeah, so smoking cessation. Um, for the past approximately about a year, maybe just a bit more, what uh, we have done as a service is bring our smoking cessation service in-house that means that we have specialist trained midwives in each team who can support you with your journey to quitting smoking okay so at the rsh for example it's me and charlotte um but if you when when you're triaged at the very beginning of your pregnancy let the midwife know that you are a smoker because when they allocate you to a midwife in the team then we can pick you up as a member of our caseload so that we can support you through that as well the thing that I always tell women about smoking in pregnancy is that it's not just for your health, it is for your baby's health as well. Because we know that when you're taking um, anything, like from anything from medication to alcohol, a certain amount crosses the placenta. Um, the effect that smoking has on your circulation and the harmful chemicals that are in cigarettes really does have quite a significant effect on babies. And Yes, there are lots of people who have smoked in pregnancy and their baby has been potentially fine. Now, that baby's either very lucky um, or there may be underlying things that might develop a little bit later in childhood. Um, it's actually, smoking in pregnancy is the leading cause of preventable miscarriage. So the best thing you can do for your baby if you smoke in pregnancy is to quit. And that is our job to support you doing that but you really have to want to do it yourself. So when we meet with you, we will talk about a realistic quit date and then we will liaise with you to make sure that you are able to keep to that. We know it's a habit. We know it's a difficult habit to break, but that's why we ask these questions saying, right, what makes you reach for that cigarette when um, you get up in the morning or what's the hardest cigarette of the day for you to give up? 
so that we can try to intervene in there either with um, helping you with the NHS smoke free uh, um, resources that we've got or with the nicotine replacement therapy. So you can see from the list there, there's a number of things that are potentially and harmfully caused by smoking. So miscarriage, as I've mentioned, uh, stillbirth as well. So that's when baby dies in the womb or shortly after giving birth. Um, an ectopic pregnancy. So that's when the pregnancy grows outside of the womb, usually in the fallopian tubes, but essentially not where it should be. Um, birth defects in babies. So babies not growing in the way that they should or um, the functions of their bodies don't work properly because of the effects of the, the chemicals in the cigarettes. Premature birth, so as you see their baby's born before 37 weeks of pregnancy. Um, a low birth weight, so yes babies who are, you know, I mean, people think oh, I don't want a massive baby because I, you know, I don't want to tear and things. Babies aren't born small um, through smoking because you know it's not a good thing, it, it's not oh good, I've had a, a smaller baby, that baby hasn't developed properly. So they haven't been able to, to put on the weight in pregnancy. They haven't been able to grow as they should. Um, so we do talk about sort of stunted growth um, when you're smoking in pregnancy as well. So sudden infant death syndrome as well, or cot death, that's when babies um, sometimes inexplicably uh, die for, for no reasons in, in sleep um, or, or in their cots, obviously, or the Moses baskets and things. But that is linked to smoking cessation um, because if you are smoking at home, because we support you postnatally as well. So once you've had this baby, the smoke kind of goes up and then it settles around about toddler height or the height of a cot. So if you're smoking at home, that is also a difficult thing uh, for babies to, to cope with because they don't have the same effect um, of their respiratory system, so their, their lungs and their breathing. And it's an increased, increased risk of infant mortality. There was a law passed a few years ago to make it illegal to smoke in cars with children, and that's because the risk of passive smoking is almost as dangerous as smoking yourself. Um, so there are, a, I know it's quite a heavyweight slide to talk about and it is quite serious. And if you are smoking yourself, you think, oh gosh, you might feel a bit attacked. We're not here to attack you or to judge you. We're here to work out how we can support you so that you're doing better things for you and your baby. I mentioned briefly the nicotine replacement therapy, which we've got there. So we offer um, nicotine patches and we offer inhalators. So you've got something to do with your hands because oftentimes that's the, the hardest thing um, to get away from. Um, we don't offer um, any sort of incentive in terms of vaping and things, and we don't offer vapes or um, vape fluid because it's not, um, what's the right word? It's not ratified on the NHS. So there's no one place that you can get it from. It's less harmful than smoking. But there aren't enough studies at the moment to say it's a safe way of getting nicotine. So do be mindful of that. But if you are vaping anyway and you're starting to do that, then that's a really, really good thing because that is going to reduce the, the chance of you uh, starting to smoke again. Um, so, yeah, there are different strengths of these nicotine replacement therapies that we can get for you. So we do just need to make sure that you are seeing the smoking cessation midwife. Um, because then they'll be able to see you. And I talked briefly, didn't I, about the, um, the antenatal appointments. We can see you and we can do phone support uh, for smoking cessation to make sure that things are on track for you every couple of weeks. And if you've, if you've fallen down a little bit, we reset a quick date for you and we go from there. But honestly, if, you are, if you're smoking in pregnancy, the best thing that you can do for your baby is to stop smoking and we will offer you as much support as we can for you to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, talking about cars, um, we are going to talk about travel and um, travel and car seat in cars. Thank you, Heather. Um, just really a little bit of advice, first of all, for you ladies during pregnancy, and then we'll we'll talk about um, car seats for your your baby as well, and um, the travel and travelling. Um, so really, ladies, it's very important whilst you're pregnant. I know it becomes more challenging as your bump grows to make sure that you're safely strapped in your, your car um, and that your airbags are, are working. So to, to make sure that the seat belt straps diagonally between your breasts and that the um, lap part of the belt sits under your bump and not across your bump, because should you need to stop in a hurry and it's across your bump, then it can um, cut in and cause cause um, quite significant bruising. So just making sure that you're strapped in and that you're comfortable when, if you're the one driving and that you can still 
especially towards the end of pregnancy, have enough space when you're driving to perform an emergency stop should you need to do so. Um, and then really looking at, at car seats for your baby. I appreciate at the moment lots of shopping and things like that is all on online and it's more challenging to try and work out that best fit for you. But really just to give you some of the, the legal and the safety um, information so that when you do do your shopping and it can be quite overwhelming with all the stripes and the patterns and the designs and the travel systems and that sort of thing if you know what's healthy and recommended it can help you navigate that that process so what we know is that legally for children under the age of 12 they should be appropriately restrained in some sort of um, car car seats and the only exception for that is children under three if they're traveling in a taxi or in an emergency where there is no seat. So even if you're not someone that drives or regularly uses a car, but you might have occasional lifts from someone else, do think about what your requirements are. And for babies up until about nine months, we ask that they're in rear facing car seats. So car seats that are facing the back of the car and ideally that those seats are fitted in the back of the car or at least if they are in the front then the airbags then do need to be deactivated so do try different models don't feel that you've got to rush these kind of decisions try different models in your car some cars have isofixes which are little um, metal fixes tucked into the the seats that you can click the seats in that way others don't depending on the age of your car if you've got more than one family car check that they fit both cars um, make sure that your car seat is fitted properly into the car um, according to the manufacturer's instructions so that it's as safe as it can be and that you've chosen a car seat that i mean most you know, new seats will conform to eu and um united nations um, safety standards please please ladies don't buy secondhand car seats you don't know we cannot know the history of those seats if you've bought them on the the internet um we don't know if they've been damaged in an accident or if there's parts missing. Only accept a seat from friends and family if you know it's history and it's not too old. So really just do think about those things. These are things that we want you to invest in safely for your baby. When you have got that car seat, practice with it at home. Even before your baby's born, you can practice with a teddy bear or a doll or something. We, we need to be sure that you know how to adjust the, the straps according to your your baby's size and the last thing you want to be doing is trying to learn that in a hurry when you're trying to go home from the princess Anne or one of the birth centers you know it's a little bit more under pressure isn't it then so so do practice in advance um, make sure you know how to, to fit your seat thinking a little bit about the seats as well we know they're quite a, a curved shape to protect your your baby in the car but we know that that means that curved shape has an impact on baby's lower lungs and spine when they're they're little so we ask you not to keep your baby in the car seat for too long so really we're saying about two hours at a time most babies if you're going on a journey will interrupt you at least two hours into that journey because they're hungry or they want changing or, or something like that but do make sure that if you are taking your baby on long journeys that you take regular breaks so that you can take baby out of that car seat um, as they get bigger obviously their, their lungs are more developed and their, their spine is strengthened anyway but really it just means ladies as well don't be tempted to think oh baby's asleep i'll keep them in the car seat when i've got home from my quick shop you know really it's not ideal babies need to come out of their car seat and be lying flat in a crib or a pram and and you know you can get travel systems that do allow you to to swap between the car seat and the pram so if you are going when, when we can shopping for the day in town or something like that going for a walk you can you can swap them swap them over and we um, uh, Heather mentioned um, cop death sudden infant death syndrome in her talk to you about smoking just now we, we do know that you just need to be very careful with, with babies not overheating as well. And we've got lots of information about this on our website on our Keeping Your Baby Safe fact sheet. So do, do go on our website. Um, I'm sure we've mentioned it, but it's www.uhs.nhs.uk forward slash maternity. Download that fact sheet because it will reiterate what I'm saying. But we do just need to think when your baby's strapped into their car seat in the car that you just do keep an eye on them you can get 
mirrors that fit on your your front windscreen if you're driving that you can look at baby in the back without having to turn around make sure that they're not slumped make sure they're not wearing a hat in the car and also it, it's not at the moment hopefully we're going to have lovely sunny weather but make sure as we come to winter that if they're in coats those snow suits that sort of thing you take them off when you strap them into the car so that really you should only get two fingers between the seat belt straps on the baby's seat and and baby itself so that they're strapped in properly so that's just really some some safety advice and then you can enjoy your your shopping um so that's sort of really looking at, at a baby's car seat safety and then just a little bit really about about traveling i know at the moment all our summer holiday travel plans seem to be a little bit scuppered um but just some tips for as and when they they resume ladies remember to take your your notes with you wherever you go um maybe not so much this summer but generally speaking every summer we usually have ladies that have come on holiday to the new forest and they have their babies with us at the princess and um, a little earlier than they planned whilst they're on holiday. So do take your notes with you wherever you go. Make sure if you're on long distance trains, cars or flying that you're, you know, keeping your uh, regular hydration, having lots of fluids, um, getting up and walking around, taking breaks so that you just keep your ankles and your, your fluids moving. We will talk to you in a moment a little bit more about some of the vaccinations we offer in pregnancy but a lot of the travel vaccinations aren't appropriate for, for pregnancy just because of the type of vaccine they are so do look into where you might be traveling if you need vaccinations are they appropriate in pregnancy whilst you still can take out that e-hit card but go on the government website to do it to avoid any um, additional fees because it should be a free card that you can down, download the application form for and above all enjoy your holiday go back a little bit to what i said about that food safety if you're you know hotel buffet food make sure you haven't had it sitting out in the sun too long making sure that you're washing fruit and vegetables um, if you go swimming swimming in the sea or a swimming pool is fine but not in rivers and hopefully have a lovely holiday before your baby comes so thank you and i think i'm passing to amy Oh no, I'm not. I'm carrying on talking myself and then I'll be part of the me. Sorry. Okay, so like I said a little bit about vaccinations and medications in pregnancy. When I spoke to you just now, we talked about um, a lot about diet. And what I meant to talk about and didn't was the things like the vitamin supplements. So um, do take a pregnancy specific vitamin supplement that will include your folic acid. Folic acid we know is really important, particularly in that first 12 weeks of pregnancy for your baby's spine development. We also want to make sure you're taking a vitamin D supplement and calcium so that you're encouraging your baby's bone development. You can take these supplements separately or you can combine it in a pregnancy specific multivitamin we ask that it's pregnancy specific because it mustn't have too much vitamin a in it so the pregnancy specific ones don't have vitamin a in them and that's the other thing i, I always forget some things i meant to say is to avoid things like liver and pate if you're a liver and pate person not to eat those during pregnancy because of vitamin a as well but do make sure you're getting those vitamin supplements for some of you ladies you may be entitled to free healthy start vitamins Details about those vitamins and how to download the forms are in your antenatal notes, but you can also Google Healthy Start and download the forms from there or speak to your, your midwife. So that's really a little bit about vitamins. Other than that, medication-wise, we know that paracetamol is okay to take in pregnancy for, for, for headaches and that sort of thing. Um, if you do have severe headaches, please speak to your, your midwife about them. Um, any other medication, really, we say speak to your doctor or your pharmacist and make sure you remind them especially you might be having phone consultations at the moment remind them that you're pregnant and that the medication is specifically for pregnancy a lot of research won't look at pregnant women with medication but um they will have some guidelines on whether or not it's safer for pregnancy and a website that you can look at if you are on any long-term medication is called bumps and the detail here is at the bottom of the page so that's just really looking at medication so things like coughs cold sneezes really ladies i'm afraid it's just paracetamol um, and on the subject of cough colds and sneezes and we're being super um, careful with our hand hygiene at the moment so really like i say wash your hands all the time um, before and after you 
go to the loo before you eat wherever when you blow your nose everything you do it's, it's hand washing isn't it at the the moment but we do offer you a, a flu vaccine we know that you are your your immune system during pregnancy is lower to carry your pregnancy and unfortunately that makes you a bit more prone to other um, infections as well so so flu you'll be offered the vaccine from the end of September to the end of March. So depending on when you fell pregnant, you may find that your pregnancy covers two vaccination periods, in which case we'll offer you the vaccine twice. We know that you're an increased risk of developing flu during pregnancy because, like I said, your immune system is suppressed and also, unfortunately, more likely to develop complications from it. So like a high temperature, pneumonia, chest infections, those sorts of things. So do have your vaccine we offer it alongside your 20-week scan um, so make sure make sure or if you find that you don't that doesn't fit timing wise we do also have a vaccination clinic here at the the princess Anne, and the details of that are in your your handheld notes or do speak to your midwife the other thing we offer you a, a vaccine for during pregnancy is whooping cough whooping cough is really to protect your baby rather than yourself we know that uh, babies that are too young to be uh, vaccinated, so they're vaccinated from about two months of age, a whooping cough, um, when their bodies can cope with the vaccine themselves. But under that two months of age, we know in around about 2012, there was an increase in the numbers of babies that had picked up whooping cough. And from then until now, we've been offering the vaccine to pregnant women. It's a um, it's not a live vaccine, so it's not going to put you at any risk of developing whooping cough yourself. It also covers other um, illnesses like polio and tetanus and diphtheria. So you'll be off giving yourself a boost against a bit against those as well. And what we know is that by offering you ladies the vaccine from about 16 weeks of pregnancy is you increase your immunity to all of those things, including the whooping cough. And then you pass that immunity to your baby via your placenta. And that helps baby to have that immunity until they're old enough to receive the vaccine themselves. So again, it's not to replace baby's vaccination so it's important that you stick to baby's vaccination program when baby's about two months of age and your health visitor will discuss that with you um, but that you do receive these vaccines during your pregnancy we can be very kind and give you both vaccines on the same day when you come in for your scan one in each arm um, but if you find that the timings don't quite work um, then don't put off one vaccine in order to have them both at the same time but do speak to your your midwife about the timings and it's just really important to have those vaccines so thank you and now I think I'll hand over to Amy thank you <laughs> thanks Louise okay so I'm um, going to speak to you about the support that we have at Southampton for for mental health and we've touched a couple of times during this presentation about the um, overwhelming um, sensations that people can feel when they're pregnant, um, especially at the moment in these in these uncertain times. I know that um, mental health has been something that is affecting all of us, but when we're pregnant, we are that much more vulnerable. Um, and it's important to know that you, you have huge amounts of support out there. We know that um, one in four adults will at some point in their lives suffer with, with mental illness um, or decreasing mental well-being. Um, these can be fleeting moments or they can be moments that re reoccur throughout our lives. You know, some people um, are susceptible to anxiety and depression right the way throughout their lives. And when we are pregnant, we know that this can be exacerbated. <clears throat> there are so many forms of support. Your, your family and friends um, are usually the people who identify that you, you might need some support during your pregnancy or after your pregnancy. Um, and if that's the case and they, they have alerted you, um, getting hold of the GP, making an appointment to see your GP is really important because they will be able to talk to you about all kinds of things, um, the steps to well-being in Hampshire, um, and I talk um, for it's, it's actually the other way around. I talk is Hampshire. The steps to well-being is Southampton. Um, so I'm sorry about that. That's wrong on the slide, but I can change it for you. Um, we have an anxiety management team at the, um, at the hospital um, who are also able to support you. They they have been doing um, live Zoom meetings for anxiety support and. 
um, they're really helpful. Occasionally, I think they come out on the maternity services um, page, they tell you when that's going to be. Um, but I've actually um, been to one of those anxiety meetings on, on Zoom and they're fabulous, really supportive. It's really nice to be speaking to other people about how you're feeling during this time. And talking sometimes is all you need to do. Um, there's also um, mindfulness. If you're somebody who practices mindfulness, um, you'll know the benefits of that, just centering yourself and um, this is a website here that you can go on and it gives you some mindfulness exercises um, to do. Mind obviously is the, um, the, the main, I suppose, the main uh, mental health organisation. Um, they have a wealth of information on their website, which is here. Um, somewhere called Anxiety UK. Um, and obviously we're, we're not just thinking about um, mums during this time, we're also thinking about birth partners. Um, dads and, and whoever the birth partners are, um, it's really important that they have support too. So we have obviously Dad's Pad, which Lorna spoke about earlier. And there's also a website called dadsmatter.org um, and there's huge amounts of support on there as well. So as you can see, we, we have at Southampton and nationally, we have huge amounts. But we, we know that mental health is as important as physical health. Um, and we are we're, we're here to support you with that so if you ever need any support at all speak to your midwife in the first instance your GP or, or access any of these but this is not an exhaustive list there are there are several organizations out there for support can I just add into that Amy when yeah, you leave, when you leave our care from midwifery care you will um, be taken over by the health visitors and they will sort of be the health professionals holding your hand for the next few years till your children go to school. So if your mood is low and if you are struggling, please be open and honest. And then they will direct you as well to forms of support and groups that are local to your area. Um, they can also do just a short questionnaire, as midwives can, to assess your mental well-being. Um, to to help you. So, as well as midwives, there are, are health visitors too. Thanks, Amy. Okay, so I'm going to go on to a bit of a taboo subject: um, sex in pregnancy. Lots of people feel really embarrassed about asking questions about sex, but everybody wants to know. Um, so, the first thing I'm going to say is that it's absolutely no problem it's, it's completely safe to have um, have sex during pregnancy unless your midwife or doctor have advised you not to and i'll go on to that in a little bit having sex will not hurt your baby um, and it's actually very normal during your pregnancy to feel more likely to want to have sex lots of people um, have a heightened sex drive during their pregnancy but of course there are those who will go the other way and not want to have sex at all the hormones can affect people in different ways. And possibly the, the most important thing that you can do is talk to each other. Talk to your partner about how you're feeling. They need to talk to you about how they're feeling. Um, and it's just about being open and honest and having an honest conversation about, about how you want to do things. So um, it might be that having sex is something that you're not prepared to do, but there are other ways that you can express your love for each other. Um, so just have a little think about different positions or, or other things that you can do um, that, that isn't intercourse. So as I said earlier, your midwife or your doctor may well have suggested avoiding sex, and that might be um, for several reasons. One of them might be if you've had bleeding in, in pregnancy, um, or if there's any risk of bleeding because your placenta is low, um, in your uterus and, and by your cervix. Um, also, if your waters have broken during the end of your pregnancy, it's advised that you, you don't have sex once your waters are broken because there is a risk of infection because that baby is not protected by the balloon of the waters. Um, so if there are any other problems with your, your cervix, um, if your cervix has started opening early or you've, um, started having tightenings or contractions before you're due, then we, we would also say to avoid having sex because that could um, increase your chances of going on to, to have a miscarriage or, or preterm labour. 
but that's only if you've been having problems with your cervix. Having sex itself doesn't cause problems with your cervix unless you, you've having having problems during your pregnancy. Um, again, this list is not exhaustive. Um, your consultant and your midwife can chat to you about sex in pregnancy and there may well be the other situations that would cause them to advise you not to have sex, but it, it's all about having those conversations. But generally in, in normal, healthy, healthy um, pregnancies, sex is not a problem at all. Let's keep talking about it. So I'm now going to hand over to Heather, I think, to talk about research from sex yes. to research. The, the, very, the very briefest of slides. I want to come down from, from your slide. Research at Southampton. Okay, so um, we <laughs> love doing research. Is it, um, Southampton hospitals are teaching hospitals and we're really proud of having lots of students because uh, it is a teaching environment, but also it's the learning environment. So we like to do as much research as we can. And of course, that means asking people to participate in that. So research is how we develop treatments and knowledge. And that lets us understand people better, the way their bodies work better, pregnancy better, all sorts of things. Um, there are so many members of the public and patients who actually um, get themselves involved in our research. And that is always going to be very helpful. Now, at the moment, all the research studies at um, University Hospital Southampton are suspended because of COVID-19. We don't want people to be coming in more often than they should um, or having any sort of invasive or non-invasive meetings, um, uh, sorry, invasive tests or non-invasive tests or coming to meetings where they can possibly avoid it. So at the moment, it is suspended. However, if you're interested in participating in research, do ask your midwife at antenatal appointments because we can contact the research midwives and say this person would really love to contribute to do this. Um, what's the best way for them to get involved? And then they can contact you directly. So there's a, a number of ones. We've got you know your placenta. The University of Southampton does amazing things researching into the placenta and how it works. We can better understand it to potentially reduce um, the number of stillbirths and uh, the effects that an, a malfunctioning placenta has. Um, the spring study um, that is going on at Southampton as well at the moment. That's another one that's on hold. So there's lots of information that we can get from you and that will improve not only our service, but nationally and potentially internationally as well. So it is really exciting. So if you want to get involved, please let us know. OK, um, just to wrap up as well, I'm going to hand over to Lorna and she's going to talk a little bit about our friends and family test. OK, thank you, Heather. And as to say, as to wrap up. So. After you've had your journey with us, we would really value your input. Um, and so you will get asked on the postnatal ward um, about feedback, for your antenatal care and your birth. And then um, when you go home, feedback from uh, your postnatal care as well. We're very lucky here. We're very proud that we always, always get high in the 90s sense of feedback of women that would recommend our service there are standard department of health um, questions that, that every single hospital asks we know we can do some things better and we value your feedback so any feedback that you have got then please give it to us any constructive ideas that you have for our service would be fabulous um, and we're just about to um, launch, and I will be interviewing this month for a Maternity Voices Partnership Chair Lead. So we're very excited about that. It has been happening nationally, and we're a bit behind the times, but we will get our group up and running. We want to hear all your voices. We want to hear, even if you don't normally give feedback, from wherever you are in the city and what part of your, your service, our service that you've used, we really would value that. So please do get involved. Please do let us hear your voice. We would love to. Um, obviously the, the COVID-19 has given us lots of different ways of engaging with you um, as well as face to face. And we look forward to our, our, our journey in the future with you and doing lots of things differently so thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you back face to face whenever we can thank you
Take care. Bye. Bye.